Hi guys and welcome to this, our uh, paper two for the 2020 further maths exam video. Now this is going to be part one and I'm going to split this into two separate parts. This one is going to be all of the core modules. All right, so I'm going to run through all the core modules and then in a, another video I'll do all of the module modules if that makes any sense. My name is Darren Mathsguru. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you can head over to mathsguru.com or uh, my YouTube channel and click like and subscribe. Uh, never going to be rich, certainly never going to be famous, but it does help me know that people are watching and it gives me that little bit of a spur to keep recording these videos because obviously you know if I don't think people are watching then I'm sitting here talking to myself in a room with a lot of very bright lights. Hopefully you did well uh, in the 2020 exam if you're watching this in 2020. If you're watching this later on uh, it's hopefully going to be good exam revision for you. All right I'm going to go through each question as much detail as, uh, detail as I can. Probably not as many calculator explanations as needed. Um, hopefully you'll be able to find the calculator but where I can I'll show you what to do. So here we go, data analysis question number one, three marks. A BMI in kilograms per square meter was recorded for a sample of 32 men and displayed in the ordered stem plot below. Now I always like the idea here that they give me the information, so 32 people, probably going to be important to me, describe the shape of the distribution. Well as far as I'm concerned it was positively, positively skewed. All right, now again, hopefully you know that it should be in your summary book um, just to know the shape because it's doing this and then coming back that way and obviously it's closer to the axes so it's positively skewed. Yeah, remember a stem plot is like a histogram or a bar chart just turned on its side. Determine the median BMI for this group of men. Again, so the median, basically we've got 32 data items so I'm going to do 32 plus 1 divided by 2 which gives me 16. 0.5. Now again, that's the quickest way to try and find out where the data item is. I'm looking for the 16th and a half data item. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So I'm going to do the 16th and the 17th data item. And again, I tend to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. And I want the 16th and the 17th data item. And so what does that tell me there? Right, so it's between that 24, 5 and 6. Now again, be very, very careful here. 21 line 6 means 21.6. So actually the value is going to fall before 24.5 and 24.6 which gives you 24.55. Now again if you're going to count from the other way uh, basically 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 and again we get 16, 17. So remember to count the right way yeah. Um, as you're going up go from the bottom of the row or the smallest numbers get bigger and if you're going to count from the other end then start at the biggest numbers and get smaller each time. People with a BMI of 25 or over are considered to be overweight. Okay what percentage of these men are considered to be overweight? Right so where are we? 25 or more is here. What I then did was count how many people were there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there are 12 people I'll write it over here. Out of 32 people, they gave me that. When I put that into my calculator and times it by 100, out came the value of 37.5%. All right, so that was question one, three marks. I thought that was quite a nice little start to the exam. Now we move on. The next size in centimeters of 250 men was recorded in displays in the dot plot below. So there we go, a lot of dots there. 250, did I count to make sure there was 250? <laughs> nope. Write down the modal next size in centimetres. Modal, I remember, means most, the one that is highest. And hopefully we realise that this column here is in fact our highest. And so the modal came out to be 38. You could have written centimetres because the question already said write it in centimetres. You didn't necessarily mean the centimetres. Assume that the 250 men has been drawn at random from a population of men whose next size is normally distributed with a mean of 38, now again, so a mean of 38, I always tend to draw this here, we've got 38, and a standard deviation of 2.3. So I'm going to keep adding on 2.3 uh, to each of these gaps, so 2.3 there, 2.3 there, and 2.3 there, and again take away 2.3, 2.3, and 2.3. Now again, is that anything to do with the question? It says, right, how many of these 250 men are expected to have a neck size that is more than three standard deviations above or below the mean. So there we go, that's three standard deviations above, very bad diagram there, and three standard deviations below. And if we remember our 68, 
95 and 99.7% rule, we know that that section there and that section there adds up to 0 0.3. So half it gives me that each section is, uh, but actually I can just do that. So what I'm looking for is 0.3% of my whole population, which was 250. They told me the total number of men there. So when I do that on my calculator, 0 0.3 divided by 100, because that percent is out of 100, and times it by 250 gave me the correct answer of one. And by saying that, I'm hoping it's the correct answer. Now then it says how many of these 250 men actually have a neck size that is more than three standard deviations away from the mean. Now, when you take 38 and add on 2.3, 2.3 and 2.3, you get 44.9. So we now know that the third standard deviation is 44.9, which is roughly there. All right, now what I'm gonna do is look in a moment to see how many dots I have above the lines I draw. And again, when I do 38 minus 2.3, minus 2.3 and minus 2.3, I get 31.1. And I think this was the trick of the question, all right? So 31.1, which basically put me there. When you now look at the number of dots that were either side of those lines, you ended up with one, all right? And I'll be fair, I looked at that for a while and went, uh, okie dokie, interesting. Have I got this right? Because it felt too easy and please don't take me uh, don't please don't get me uh, wrong okay use the five number summary to construct a box plot showing any outliers if appropriate again to be honest with you guys when i did this first i missed that part of the sentence and there are outliers in this okay so first things first if i draw this graph i know that i have a median sorry i've got my first quartile at 36 I have my third quartile at 39, and I have a median at 38. So I can draw that first section there, and you would have to draw this much, much better. You can have lines uh, separated all of this. Now, this is where I first made my stake. I went, okay, my maximum is 44, my minimum is 31, join the points together, and I was as happy as Larry. Nah, sadly not, because I was tricked. It does say showing any outliers, and you are advised to make sure that you look for the upper and lower fence. Now, when you work the fences out, and I'm not gonna do that now, you actually got an upper fence of 43.5 and a lower fence of 31.5. And as it turns out, that meant that our lowest data item was actually 32. So I drew a line to 32, and then I did a cross or a circle. And then my highest data item worked out to be 43. And so I did a line to there, and then I did one cross there at 44. Because when you go back to the data, you had one at 44, and you had uh, one at 31. All right, so, uh, and I happen to know that that is where the two marks are for. All right, so again, you must draw these accurately. Question number three, in a study of the association between BMI and neck size, 250 men were grouped together by neck size. Okay, so they gave us a load of information there. Five number summaries were given. Uh, they give me some diagrams and it said what percentage of these 250 men were classified as having below average neck size. Okay, so uh, when I did this question here, what did we say? So what percentage of these 250 men had below average neck size? Because we know the graph here has, or the below average section here has a total count of 50, we know that there would be 50 out of the total number of men, and what did it say there were, again, 250. And I would times that by 100 because it wanted it out of a percentage, so moving this up gave me 20% of my uh, men were classified as below. What is the interquartile range of BMI for the neck with an average neck size? Again, so we're going to go to the average neck size and it wants the interquartile range. So we're going to highlight the data that was average and we know that the interquartile range is equal to the upper quartile minus the lower quartile or in this situation Q3 minus Q1 which gave me 26.0 minus 23.4, which when I put it into my calculator, gave the correct answer of 2.6. And I keep saying correct answer. Look, at the end of the day, these are my answers. I'm fairly sure they are 100% correct, but I'm open to suggestions below. People with a BMI of 30 or more are classified as being obese. Assume a BMO values were all rounded to one decimal place. How many of the 250 men were classified as obese? And again, so more than 30 
And that, I think, where here was where people got tricked. First things first, we know 25% of the people who were above average were in fact obese. So we wanted to work out 25% of 76, okay, uh, which was 19. But you then had to add on those four people there, which gave you 23 people as obese. I think a number of kids I spoke to in my particular school thought that that was a little bit tricky or they'd, they'd missed those four. Does the box plot support the contention that BMI is associated with an exercise? So obviously you had to answer yes or no. Yes, uh, there is an association. And then we go on and say, well, as the next size. Now again, excuse my handwriting there, but uh, from what I can understand from past experience of doing these type of questions, you had to say yes, there was an association. You then had to turn around and say, well, as the next size increases from below average to above average, the median, now again, I know that our uh, further math guru uh, that I work with um, basically says you always choose the median and you have to put all of the values. Don't just say 21.6 to 28.1. You have to say all of them because you have to show that there is an increase. All right, so there we go. That was effectively what you were looking at writing. Question number four of the aging years. Uh, body density in kilograms per litre and weight of a sample of 12 men, 23 blah blah blah, are shown below. For these 12 men, determine their median age in years. Well, median, again, I've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, oh, I can't count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And so I am looking for 12 plus 1, 6 and a half day dry item. So I'm looking somewhere between the 6th and 7th day dry item. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, Somewhere between the 6th and 7th, well, basically halfway between 24 and 24 is 24. The mean of their body density in kilograms per litre. Now again, I'm not going to do the calculator work here for you, but basically you just put all of this into your um, calculator and then get it to work out um, one step, you know, the... the uh, the data, oh, what am I trying to say? You, you just basically get it to work out the mean of that information. So uh, when I put the body densities in and added those all together and divided by uh, the number there were or using my calculator, out come the value of 1.065. And I put all of the values down there. A least squares line is to be fitted to the data with the aim of predicting body density from weight. Now again, when you're predicting the one that goes on the uh, vertical axis, which is the response variable, is always the one that you want to predict. Yes, the one on the bottom is the explanatory variable. So name the explanatory variable for the least squares line. It was weight. Determine the slope of this least squares line and basically round your answer to three significant figures. Again, I put my data into my calculator and I did a least squares regression analysis, making sure that I had uh, either y equals a plus bx, or if you're using a, a different calculator, you can have ax plus b. Regardless, making sure that you understood which one you were looking for there. I think actually that's not that way around. I have a feeling that's B plus AX. I can't remember. Either way, using the calculator the right way, determine the slope you got minus 0 0.00112. Now, if you were using the Casio class pad, I think that came out with exponential form and you had to basically convert it. But because the question wanted it to three significant figures, you had to have it 0 0.00112. Again, having done all of this on my CAS calculator um, and done that sort of uh, linear regression line, the next part of the question was just reading off the information. What percentage of the variation in body density can be explained by the variation in weight? That's looking for the value of R squared from this analysis. Now, obviously, R squared on your calculator comes out as a decimal value. You would need to multiply that by 100 because the question said, what percentage, right? And when I did that again, round it to the nearest percentage that came out to be 29%. All right, sorry I haven't done the calculator stuff, guys. It takes ever such a long time to put all this stuff in and, and I've spent ever such a long time getting these answers ready. The scatterpot below shows body density in kilograms per liter plotted against uh, waist measurement for centimeters again of 250 men. Cool, a lot of information on 250 men. When a least squares line is fitted to the scatter block, they give you the equation of this line. Awesome, thank you very much for the equation of the line here. Draw the graph of this least squares line on the scatter plot. Now again, you have to be really, really accurate here. So what I did was I put 70 in, and if I remember rightly, 120. Why did I put those in? To be honest with you, 
I actually put 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 120 into my cash calculator because I wanted a number that came out relatively close to one of my tick marks or my intercepts there. And when I did 70, I got, uh, what did I get? Just above that point there. And then when I got 120, I got, where was it? Just above that point there. And then I used a ruler to connect them together. Guys, this is gonna be horribly skewed. Um, and there we go. Now, again, making sure not to have it go extend outside the axes here, because it wouldn't have made a lot of sense. <clears throat> you have to draw these things accurately, because from what I understand from examiners from previous year, if you don't, you have to lose the mark. Use the equation of the least squares line to predict the body density of a man whose waist is 65. Well, again, that was uh, simply a case of putting it into the calculator because we're looking for body density. The formula says do 1.195 multiplied by 0, 0, 0, 1, 5, 1, 2 times the waist measurement. They told you the waist measurement was 65 centimeters. And when I put that into my calculator, <coughs> rounded to two decimal places, out came 1.10 kilograms per liter, all right? Um, I put the <coughs> uh, units in there because they hadn't given me the units in the question. Always need to be careful there. There are always, I think, one mark deducted for units in these questions and somewhere they won't give you the unit. Using the equation of this least square lines to make the prediction in part B, are you extrapolating or interpolating? Well, again, if we notice our lowest data item here is just about 70. Our highest data item here is 126. Because we were looking for 65, that was outside of our data that they had given us, in which case it was extrapolating, which I can't spell at this moment in time. There we go. More. Interpret the slope of this least squares line in terms of a man's body density and waist measurement. Again, these are the type of questions that are just scaffolded and you write the wording in your summary book and really just regurgitate. So, and there we go. So, the, the, the scaffolding stuff here says for every one centimeter increase, these are the words they are looking for. They want you to say for every one unit increase along the explanatory variable, and again, they've given you it centimeters, they want the word increase <coughs> in waist measurement, put the units in there, say what it is. Body density decreases. So we're looking for increase and increase or decrease and decrease by, and again, the value that the gradient <coughs> actually tells you. Yeah? So again, being able to take that regression analysis equation or that least squares line and turning it into something meaningful, really, really important. In this study, the body density of a man with a waist measurement of 122 centimeters was that. Show that when the least squares line is fitted, the residual now, because it's a show that question, you've got to show you're working out. So what I did was I said, well, okay, let's work out the predicted. They've given me the formula of 1.195 minus 0 0.001512 times. I'm now going to put in the value of 122, and that gave me 1.010536. The actual value they gave me in the question was 0 0.995, and so therefore my residual, if you wonder what those three marks are, they're therefore was equal to 0 0.995 minus 1.010536, which gave me the required answer of 0 0.02, and in brackets, two decimal places. To show that, you've got to show you're working out. Unfortunately, you don't show you're working out, <coughs> you're not going to get the answer. One mark seems like a lot of working out. This type of question is a huge trick question. The coefficient of determination for this is 0.6783. So what they're telling you here is r squared is 0 0.6783. 6783 and they want you to find the value of r. Well okay that means we need to square root 0 0.6783 but remember when you do a square root you can actually end up with two values which gave me plus or minus 0 0.824. Which one is it going to be? Well if we go back to our data because it was sloping down it meant we had to have a negative r and again I know a number of people were very upset with this question because while they thought it was easy, it was one of those standard tricks. The residual pot plot associated with fitting a least squares line to this data is shown below. Does it support the assumption of linearity? And the answer is yes, as there is no clear pattern. My handwriting is shocking. Not normally this bad, but I'm trying to get through these answers so the video is not too long. Right, question number six. The table below shows the mean age in years and the mean height in centimetres of 648 women from seven different age groups. Awesome. 
What was the difference in centimeters between the mean height of the women in their 20s, so the mean height of the women in their 20s, and the mean height of the women in their 80s? Now, obviously, bear in mind I stuffed up paper one, question number one, and I think that was the only one I stuffed up because I was so excited I didn't say the right answer. Fingers crossed, when we do a 167.1 minus 156.7, I ended up with 10. And again, I'm going to put centimeters here. They've already said centimeters in the question, but blah, a scatter plot describing the data shows the association. Describe this association in terms of strength and direction. Okay, strength is strong. How do I know that? To be honest with you, I just looked at the data item. It, they were relatively close together and a negative association. Now, sadly, when I did this first time, I put the word linear and then I was like, ah, no. But we know the data isn't linear. Okay, so unfortunately, I think if you put the word linear, you're going to lose that mark. So it's strong negative association. The line on the scatter plot. Uh, using those two points, term in the line of the equation. Again, I use the formula y minus y1 equals mx minus x1. That's the equation of a straight line when you've got <clears throat> points. Now, I can find the value of m by simply doing y2 minus y1 on x2 minus x1. Now again, y2, if we did 157 minus 168 divided by 85 minus 20, that gave me my gradient. And when I actually did this question, um, I used the numbers 168 there and 20 there. I ended up uh, with the final equation of the mean height was 171. And again, you've got to be very careful here because the question said correct with three significant figures. Plus, mm -hmm, nice trick there, 0 0.169 times the mean age. In a further analysis of the data release squares line was fitted, the associated residual plot was generated below. Now, because there is a clear pattern there, it would suggest it was non-linear, okay? Um, so when there's a clear pattern, it's non-linear. The residual plot indicates the association is non-linear. Well, that was a very nice one, thanks very much. The data presented in the table on page 12 is repeated below, and it can be linearized by applying an appropriate transformation. Now, again, it says apply an appropriate transformation. Now, the great thing is that when you look at your circles of transformations, there was either an X squared or a Y squared that fit that data, which is pretty much what happened. Uh, when I did some calculator, it gave a beautiful curve. Uh, beautiful curve, whatever. And basically, I just put that in. And then because it told me it wanted me to apply it to the mean age, that was my x value, and so they effectively wanted me to do an x squared transformation. Again, putting my data into the calculator and doing an x squared transformation, I'm not going to do that, guys. If you want me to do that, by all means, leave a comment below, and I'll add an addendum to the video. I won't record it again, but I'll certainly add a section later on that shows you all the calculator work, if that would be useful for you. But otherwise, putting that on there, doing an x squared transformation, I ended up with the answer as. Now again, I put height, you have to put the variables. Yes, probably should put mean height. Let's just be correct, is equal to 167.9. Again, it wanted me to four significant figures in this one, minus 0 0.001621 times my mean age <clears throat> in brackets and squared. Because we were doing an x squared transform, we needed to make sure that my x value, which was the mean age, is squared and my mean height. Okay, so again, that was the equation that you needed to do. I think the biggest problem here was just doing things to decimal places. That's the first section done. Now we moved on to the recursion and financial modeling section. Again, I think this was generally straightforward. Again, I'm so, so sorry if you found this really, really hard. Um, I, I don't mean to come over as anything other than trying to be supportive, but um, it really does depend on what you've got in your summary book and, and your understanding here. So by what amount in dollars does the value of the machine decrease each year? If we can learn how to read these recurrence relationships, then we notice that it actually decreases by $15,000 per year. Because to get to our next value, you take the previous value and subtract 15,000. Showing recursive calculations. You have to show the calculations. It is not good enough with these questions just to put down the values that you get as your final answer. I'm sorry, it says show the calculations. Now, when I did this, we put V0 was 120,000. I don't know that you have to put the V0 value, but you would definitely have to put V1 is equal to 120,000 minus 15,000, which gave me 105,000. And I'm going to put the dollars in there to be accurate. And V2 then worked out to be 105,000 
minus 15,000, which gave me 90,000. And again, one mark for showing that information, but if you didn't show the calculations, sorry, it didn't happen. What annual flat rate percentage of depreciation is used by Samuel? Because it goes down $15,000 per month. That means I'm going to do 15,000 divided by my start amount of 120,000 and turn it into a percentage uh, times it by a thousand, try that one again, times by a hundred to turn into a percentage and gave me 12.5 percent. Yeah, so because it's just going down by that 15,000 and because you want a flat rate of depreciation, you basically work out how much has gone down and divide it by initial amount. The value of the machine in dollars after n years can also be written by a rule. So again, being able to convert between uh, recurrence relationships and rules, really, really important. It says, write down the value of this. Well, to get to any value, I want to do my start amount, or start amount, and I want to take away 15,000 multiplied by n. Now you don't need to do the times by n, you could have just done 15,000 n. But because we were simply taking away 15,000 over and over and over again, and we just wanted to work out how many 15,000 we were subtracting, we just multiply it by N. Okie dokie, now, amortization tables, love, 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 using. So we've got some blanks here. Interest is calculated monthly, and Samuel makes monthly payments of $1,600. Awesome. Interest is charged at 3.6% per annum, <clears throat> okay. But I also need to be very careful that here is calculated monthly and they give me a per annum rate. So what I'm gonna do there is do 3.6 divided by 12. That's gonna give me my monthly rate of interest. Um, and obviously divide by 100 again, which will give me my multiplier. Just doing this to one side. Using the values in the amortization table, calculate the principal reduction associated with payment number three. Okay, the principal reduction, as far as I'm concerned, there were two different ways of doing it. When I did it deliberately, initially, I did it the hard way. If you just do those two values there, subtracted from each other, you get the correct answer of $643.85. Yeah, I did it the really long way and basically did um, <clears throat> this value here, subtract that value there, which works, just gives you the same answer, but probably principal reduction would have made much more sense by taking away the principles. Calculate the balance of the loan after payment number four is made and round your answer to the nearest cent. Now, all right, so we had 643.85. My advice here is when you use your calculator, don't round things, all right, or use the values all the way to the very, very end. So basically the interest. We now know that we've got to work out this interest rate here by doing 318074.23 times by that value there, that multiplier there, All right? So 3.6 divided by 12 divided by 100. Now, when you did that and you rounded it, and careful again <laughs> to round it, $954.22, okay? So there we go. Principal reduction, again, now in this situation, you had to do it the way that I did before. You do the 1600 minus the 954.22 gave you $645.78. And when you now do, he says highlighting this value here, subtract that value there, you get 317.428.45, right? So again, this value here was 317.428.45. Five. All right, now sadly, uh, when I did this initially, I got 0.44. I think that would have been incorrect because of rounding errors, don't round. Let SN be the val balance of Samuel's loan after N month. Write down a recurrence relation in terms of those that could be used to model the month to month balance of the loan. Now, here we go. We know that S0 is equal to 320000. That came from our first value, that was our opening balance. And we now know that to get to S of N plus one, you're gonna take the previous balance, all right, which is gonna be S of N, multiply it by our interest rate plus one. Again, there are all, all of these are formulas again, yes? Yeah? So if you remember, that's gonna be one plus R over 100, that's my multiplier. And we know that R is 3.6 divided by 12, <coughs> yeah? Um, and that gave me a multiplier of 1.003. And then I'm gonna take away 
the $1,600 because that's how much we're taking away each month after the interest has been added on. All right, so again, one mark again. Question number nine, Samuel opens a savings account. Brilliant. Uh, what have we got here? We have another recurrence relationship. No, actually we have, yep, a recurrence relationship. And again, to get to the next term, we take the previous term and multiply it by 1.03. Write down the value of B4. Now again, I just put this into my sequences thing. I just said, well, okay, we've got the equation, fired up my Casio class pad, found the sequences thing, and uh, what dropped out? Well, the value of $5,060.27. Calculate the monthly interest rate uh, for Samuel's savings account. Right, again, 1.003 uh, interest savings rate. Well, I'm gonna take away one from that, which gave me 0.003. Um, I'm going to, <clears throat> what is that, per year? Uh, let it be the dollars a month after it was open. All right, and then basically multiply that by 100. I don't need to multiply it by 12. Why? Well, basically, they've given me that this formula is per month. They want my monthly interest rate. So I just need to turn this value here into a multiplier, which gave me 0.3%. After one year, the balance of Sam's savings account to the nearest dollar is the $5,168. If Sam has deposited an extra $50 at the end of each month, immediately after the interest was added, how much extra money would be in the savings account after one year? Again, I just used uh, the financial solver. Uh, sorry, I used my recurrence thing here and just went, well, okay, I'm starting with B0 equals 5,000. And I now want my B of N plus one to be 1.003 B of N but I'm gonna add on 50, because it says it's gonna add on $50 at the end of each month. Now, when I do that, I actually get $5,793. I'm gonna take away the $5,183, because basically it just says, what's the extra amount of interest he would get? And so it worked out to be $610, okay? Question number 10, Sam now invests 500,000 in an annuity from which he receives a regular monthly payment. The balance of the annuity in dollars after n months can be modeled by that recurrence relationship. Okay, so again, if we remember what an annuity is, that's my opening balance, he says, trying to highlight and then just drawing through it. That's my opening balance. Obviously, I'm gonna have some form of interest on it that I'm gonna take away then $2,000, is it per month? Uh, yep, uh, to be able to spend. Calculate the balance of the annuity after two months, if K equals that. Again, I put it into my sequences section, 500,000. We now know that A of N plus one is K, which is 1.0024 times A of N minus 2,000. When I put that into my sequences section, out comes the fabulous value of $498,398.08. Calculate the annual compound interest rate if K is equal to 1.0024. So again, 1.0024, I'm gonna subtract the one to give me 0.0024, 0, 0, uh, 0 that's per month, times it by 12, and divide my, uh, sorry, and then multiply that, he says, by 100. Uh, leaving that divide by one, gave me an interest rate of 2.88%. All right, for what value of K would this interest act as a simple perpetuity? Now for perpetuity, basically, if you remember, the amount of uh, money in my account stays the same. So if that's the case, it means that my interest would equal $2,000 per month. So I've just got to work out what interest rate would give me $2,000 per month. Well, that's 2,000 divided by how much is in the account, 500,000, and times it by 100 gives me uh, what value of K? Uh, ignore that. I don't think I times it by 100. I got uh, 0.004. And so therefore, all right, that's my value of interest. But because I want it to grow, I've got to add on the one to that. So therefore, my value is 1.004. Or K is equal to 1.004. Later, Samuel will take out, oh, hold on a moment. This is a reducing, uh, sorry, a change of conditions. Righty-ho. Sam took out a new reducing balance loan. The interest rate for this loan was 4.1% per annum compounding monthly. Okay, let's just highlight that, 4.1 compounding monthly. The balance of the loan after four years of monthly payments was given as that, okay. The balance of the loan after seven years of monthly payments was that, and Sam will continue to make the same monthly repayment. To ensure the loan is fully repaid to the nearest cent, the final balance will be lower. 
In the first seven years, Sam makes 84 monthly payments. Uh, <clears throat> from this point on, how many more monthly payments will Sam make to fully repay the loan? So when I put this into my calculator, I worked out that my monthly repayment came to be $2,400. Yeah. Now again, how do we know that? We've got here a principal value We've got here a final value, and believe it or not, we have the number of payments between that. Yeah, because we know for five, six, seven years, there were three years between those four, five, six, seven. Yep, so the three years between that, three times 12 gave me 36. They gave me the interest rate of 4.1%, put it into my financial, financial solver, and out came my monthly payment of $2,400. Now, knowing that, I then had to go back and find my principal value. So, and again, it was um, having known my monthly payment, I know what my loan was uh, at the uh, end of the fourth year. I could then backtrack to find out what my principal value of the loan was. Yep, so when I did that, I found the principal value of the loan was $385,895.59. Okay. And then I worked out that, uh, okay, so keeping that the same, if we want to pay off our loan, that meant that the future value then became zero. And I think I ended up with 233.7 payments because I was solving for M. Now, obviously, we can't make 233.7 payments. It wants my final payment to be lower. This was a bit of a trick to the question. So what they were saying was, well, okay, we've got to do 234 payments. Right, so we're going to do 234 payments minus the 84 that they'd already made. And because the question said, how many more monthly payments gave me 150 payments? All right, this question was funky in the fact that it sort of changed conditions. It wanted three different things. You work this out, but it's all down to comprehension. And there we go, ladies and gentlemen, that is the end of this core section for our paper two. I'm gonna actually record the next section shortly and we'll upload it soon. All right, so I'm gonna work through uh, the modules as often as I possibly can, or as much as I possibly can. Um, but for this video, thank you very much. Please click like, subscribe, and uh, do me the favor of spreading the word about mathsguru.com. Um, have a great day, stay safe, and good luck with your ATAR if you are looking forward to one coming out, uh, or otherwise, good luck with any forthcoming exams. Take care, bye-bye.